Uh, to get into the lesson tonight, when I was originally asked to preach on a, a, a Sunday in late May, uh, it was cold outside. It was probably, uh, I don't know, December or January. I had a fire roaring in the garage, the wood-burning stove, and, and I'm thinking about the, the hardest thing for me when I deliver a lesson is to try to figure out what in the world I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to give Kenny a heads up and make sure he has my wireless mic on because I'm going to walk around a little bit. But that, the, the hardest thing for me is to always think about what I'm going to talk about. Lots of things will run through my head, and I'll sit down, and I'll be studying, and I'll think, oh, I can go this direction, I can go that direction. So I thought, this time it's going to be different. Right from the beginning, I'm going to talk about something. I'm going to pick my subject, and that way I've got months to think about this and uh, think about different applications. So uh, it may not seem like a, a seasonal thing to talk about sitting by the fire, but uh, that was in my mind when I was uh, asked to speak, and so that's, uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and then, funny enough, on Friday I have a coworker who just bought a house, and he's first time he's ever had a fireplace before. He's asking me, like, okay, so what do I do? How do I work this? You know, and all that stuff. So I'm giving him some pointers about keeping, uh, keeping a fire in his house and keeping his house warm and not making it colder. That's uh, uh, one thing a lot of people are surprised about. You build a fire in the house and think it's going to be hotter, but it actually makes it colder because it pulls all the air in through the windows and the unheated parts of the house. But I won't get into that. But uh, so the first thing I... I did when I decided I was going to talk about uh, fire was I looked up my handy concordance on my computer or uh, I did a keyword search and I looked for fire. And I started looking at all these scriptures and oh boy, fire is mentioned a lot in the scriptures, uh, but it's rarely mentioned in a good, good manner. Uh, usually it's something like someone was struck down by fire from the Lord or the towns were burned to the ground or the fields were burned to the ground. And, you know, this was consumed by fire, that was consumed by fire. There's a lot of stories in the Bible about fire burning up things because it wasn't good or whatever. But there are some, some good points about fire as well. Uh, there are a few scriptures that talk about uh, fire being good to keep warm or bake bread or refine metals, which is sometimes a good thing or a bad thing. But uh, uh, another thing that's mentioned in there is purification, which I thought was uh, an interesting point, using fire to purify things. Uh, if we look at Numbers uh, chapter 31, the Lord told Moses to take vengeance on the Midianites. Um, starting in, uh, in verse 19 in Numbers chapter 31, all of you uh, who have killed anyone or touched anyone who was killed must stay outside the camp for seven days. On the third and the seventh days, you must purify yourselves and your captives. Purify every garment as well as everything made of leather, goat hair, or wood. Continuing in 21. Uh, then Eleazar the priest said to the soldiers who had uh, gone into battle, This is the requirement of the law that the Lord gave Moses. Gold, silver, bronze, iron, tin, lead, and anything else that can withstand fire must be put through fire. And it will be clean. But it also must be purified with the water of cleansing. And whatever cannot be withstand the fire must be put through that water. On the seventh day, wash your clothes, and you will be clean. Then you may come into the camp. Uh, fire was used here to, to purify things. They, they'd gone through battle. They'd gotten bloody. They had gotten things all over them. Uh, you know, some of this was, was ritualistic, but, uh, uh, you know, they, they were instructed to uh, kill the women back in verse 15 because... They were a means of turning the Israelites away from the Lord and what happened in Peor. There was, there was a cleansing that was going on there in, in a couple senses. They're, they're uh, doing the, these rituals that the Lord has asked them to do, uh, cleansing not only the items but the people that they have. They have these captives, and they've seen where uh, these groups that the Israelites have, have taken over, uh, they don't kill everybody in the group. They let some of them survive. They let them hang out with them. A few of them work their way in and start saying things and doing things that are against the Lord's will. So there's a purification that's going on here. They're even killing the women because it was the women that were the means of turning the Israelites against the Lord uh, and Peor. But what's with the purifying everything else? What's with putting the things through the fire? Uh, maybe when you were young, you, you saw something cool on the ground and you picked it up and you're checking it out and your mom or your dad said, put that down, you don't know where that's been. You know, we know that 
something that's been on the ground or something that's maybe bloodied or whatever, there's, there's germs and pathogens and things like that that we don't like. But germ theory is a relatively new thing and they weren't concerned about microbes or viruses or bacteria at that point. So uh, even though the Lord was telling him to do this, and uh, you know, I'm sure there are a variety of reasons and reasons that I haven't thought of, that's certainly something to think about. Anybody who had touched a dead body or anybody who killed anybody, you have any number of diseases on you, and before you brought those into the camp, the Lord wanted you to be purified. And fire was the one of the ways that that, that was uh, handled. Um, we look at the, the wisdom of the Lord here. Um, you know, modern day wisdom when this thing was happening, you know, there's other groups that would have uh, drunk the blood of their enemies so that they may great gain their strength. And here, you know, the Lord's telling them to stay away from it. Uh, you know, if, if you got a splinter on your hand, put donkey dung on it, and that'll help get the splinter out. You know, now we think about that, and like, what are you thinking? Well, that's what people thought back then, the things that people came up with. But, of course, the Lord has had different instructions for the Israelites to keep them poor, that are pure. They didn't understand everything that they were doing. That, you know, now with more knowledge and wisdom, we can look back and see what he was doing there, uh, at least in part. Um, but they had no idea, but they were just doing what they were told by faith. The Lord was, was uh, on their side. They were doing what he was, uh, had asked them to do, and, uh, and they were all good. Now, that really doesn't have anything to do with my lesson tonight, or not much with it. We'll, we'll get into following uh, by faith in a little bit, but I'm just kind of throwing that one out there for free. Uh, just because it's, it's just another bit of, uh, of wisdom in the Bible that I think helps reinforce uh, the, just the, the magnitude of the, the scriptures, the, the knowledge that is embedded in there, the things that people were told to do uh, for reasons they didn't understand then, and we don't yet understand all of them now. Uh, you know, if, even today there's things that we get into that... You know, God asked us to do this, and we may have a different idea. It's like, well, you know, that doesn't seem right, but it's not our place. Creator of the universe knows better than we do, and we have to recognize that and, and follow, follow our instruction by faith. We can't always justify everything by man's wisdom. The road I kind of want to go down uh, tonight, uh, being on fire for the Lord, is more in reference to a modern-day uh, figure of speech, per se. Say somebody's on fire for something. You watch a sports game and somebody's just, you know, they're out, they're out there, they're, they're playing hard, maybe a basketball game, somebody slamming dunk after dunk or, or a baseball game, you know, slam, uh, grand slams or, or any number of things. You can tell when somebody is on fire. They, they uh, have uh, excitement in them. There's vigor, fervor, gusto. They're, they're getting out after it. They're, they're putting everything into it. They're putting their all into it. They're, they're leaving themselves consumed so that at the end of the day, at the end of the event, at the end of whatever they're participating in, they are all used up. Much like fire, you light something on fire. If the fire is complete and it burns well, at the end, there's almost nothing left. Very little, anyway. Especially when you're burning stuff in a... In a a wood stove, like what, I, uh, what I'm doing when I'm trying to heat my garage, you know, you put a pile a lot of wood in there, and then in the end of the day, there's only a little bit of that. <coughs> Everything is consumed. It's all used up. But in order to be an effectful fire, in order to do the job that I'm looking for it to do, which is to heat my garage, uh, an, an effective fire needs three things. I'm not going to go down the scientific route where it needs fuel and, and uh, oxygen and heat or spark or whatever uh, what I'm what I'm thinking more along the lines is uh, uh, other things that you have to think about when you're building that fire an effective fire needs the right fuel first of all when I'm looking for fuel to burn in my wood burning stove I can burn a lot of things in that wood burning stove and it will make heat but whether or not the heat is good is subject to argument. Uh, I can burn hardwoods that'll make a lot of heat. I can burn softwoods that won't make as much heat, but they can gum up the works and leave creosote in the chimney and makes a mess and can cause a chimney fire and all kinds of things like that. Uh, you can burn rotted wood, and that's fine. It's not going to do much damage, but 
There's an interesting thing about wood when you burn it. When, when you take a tree and you cut it down and that wood is seasoned, if you let that wood sit and rot and let nature take its course, there's a lot of energy in that, in that wood. And over the course of years, things will come in and they will rot that wood away. Energy will leave that wood in one form or another. And in the end, that wood will crumble down and be pretty much nothing, ash or, or dust. And essentially, it's the same state as if you burned it. There's no difference in the amount of energy that has left the wood, only the question of how quickly did you get the energy out. So rotted wood will burn, and rotted wood is fine, but you don't get as much heat. It's not as effective as burning uh, fresh wood, seasoned. You know, if you have moisture in it, obviously it isn't going to burn well. Uh, dense woods make more heat than less dense woods and things like that. There's a lot of considerations when you're looking for the right fuel. So you kind of have to educate yourself when you're out there looking for what you're going to burn in the fuel because fuel is sold by volume. And so you have to think about, well, if I pay so much money for so much volume, I can buy a, a, a rick of walnut or I can buy a rick of Osage orange or what a lot of people call hedge. And it may take up the same amount of volume but when I burn those in my fireplace, in my wood burning stove, I'm going to get a lot more heat for my money out of that Osage orange than I'm going to get out of that walnut. You have to think about where you're going with that. We look at the scriptures, and, and of course, uh, Nadab and Abihu come up a lot um, when we talk about fires, strange fires. They shoot, chose the wrong thing to burn. They offered a strange fire to the Lord. And they were consumed, they were, they were struck dead because of this. And it, it, it's interesting that if you look to the scriptures, their demise is spoken of no less than four times. Uh, Levit Leviticus 10, Numbers 3, Numbers 26, and again in 1 Chronicles, Nadab and Abihu come up as meeting an untimely demise due to a decision that they made. When I was in school, uh, and a very important lesson that I learned once was if your teacher is up in front of the class talking and they make the effort to say something, it's probably important because most teachers only have a limited amount of time to say what they want to say, so they've got to try to cram as much into your head as possible. Now, some of it may be a little fluff to try to keep you awake, keep the gears turning or whatever, but if they say something, it's generally important, and you should take note of it. If they say something twice, then it's really important, and so you should really take note of it. And if they turn around and write it on the chalkboard or write it down on a piece of paper and hand it out to you so that you can have notes or whatever, then it's really, really, really important. Over here we see it's written down not just once, not just twice, written down multiple times in the scriptures. It says to me there's a lot of importance in this story of Nadab and Abihu. There's a lot of importance in, in remembering that just because you think you're worshiping God or you think you're doing God's work, you think you're helping people out or doing what's right, if you're not paying attention to what you're doing, if you think you're wiser than God or you think that, that uh, well, you know, he said this, but I think this will be okay or even it's just an accident. If you're not on the ball, if you're not on the game, there can be serious consequences for that. Another factor in an effective fire is that it needs to be in the right place. Year after year, I hear stories, I read stories about fires, you know, especially at the beginning of winter, but all winter long you hear them. Fires that occurred in, in a house because somebody had a fireplace and they were burning things up and they were getting a good pile of ash in there and they'd go to clean it out and they put it in their ash bucket or whatever. And instead of letting it sit in that bucket for a while and cool off, they dump it in a plastic trash can or something. They're careless with the embers that they're pulling out of there. That fire is not in the right place anymore. It may smolder for a while. They go to bed, and if they're lucky, they wake up and find the fire and escape. But there were a couple times this winter that a similar situation like that happened. One of them even made national news. Um, big house that was being renovated. They're heating with wood. They scooped the ashes into some place that wasn't proper. And everybody in the house, but I think maybe one, perished because they weren't careful with the fire. It wasn't in the right 
place. We hear a lot the, the, the saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, kind of, I think about that saying, and I, I think there can be a couple uh, double meanings. It actually goes back a little bit. Uh, um, St. Bernard of Clairvoy, uh, who lived from 1091 to 1153, is credited with, with saying basically the, the initial statement there, hell is full of good intentions or desires. I see two, two meanings here. Good intentions without any actions is nothing. And that's pretty easy. We can look at James 2, uh, starting about 14, I'll read. Uh, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, verse 18, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was it not our ancestor Abraham? Uh, was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. His faith was made complete by what he did, and the scripture was fulfilled. Uh, and the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does, not by faith alone. In the same way, not even Rahab the prostitute, uh, was not even Rahab the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. We can think all kinds of good thoughts. We can think this and that or whatever, but we, if, we're not, if we're not on fire, if we're not motivated enough to go out and do something, all the faith in the world is useless. Another thought on that is of the roads to hell being paved with good intentions. A lot of people do a lot of things that they think are good. There's a lot of people who sometimes do the wrong thing, but for the right reasons, so to speak. Well-meaning people, they want to help, they want to do something good, but their very actions violate the scriptures, whether it's through ignorance or uh, just arrogance. God said we should do this, but you know what? If we do this, I bet we can bring in twice as many people on Sunday. You know? I think if we go this way with the church, if we, if we start implementing this program or that program, yeah, the Bible says that, that's kind of old-fashioned. I think God really meant that for someone else. If we go in this direction, we can grow the church tenfold. Find that man's wisdom, they think they're doing good. But in the end, those good intentions aren't going to count for anything. They're going to be right in that same spot with Nadab and Abihu. Uh, let's look at a couple scriptures. Uh, Luke 10, uh, verse uh, 38, starting in 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha <coughs> opened her home. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet uh, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me? to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Boy, how many times do I hear that with my two girls? She's not helping anybody. Just the way sisters are, I guess. Maybe brothers too. My brother here? Okay. Continuing in 41. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. The, 
The desire to do good, accompanied by a lack of faith in God's word, gives us many things. We see open-minded churches out there, open-minded organizations that call themselves churches, organizations that claim to be filled with God's love. Oh, come worship with us, feel the spirit, we have a great time, we've all got an awesome band, we do this and that, all this great things going on. But in the end, they're engaging in things that are specifically forbidden by the scripture. We also have groups on the other end. I kind of classify them as hate groups. Not that hard to think of some. There's a few just, uh, just a few miles up the road from us. They make national news all the time. They claim to be of the Lord, but what they do seems to be filled with hate. God hates this. God hates that. He's after you because of this. Hate, hate, hate. You guys are going to hell. Look at us. Look at how righteous we are. You guys are per persecuting us because we're righteous. That's what the scriptures say. Complete flip side of the coin, but they're showing no love of Jesus at all in what they're doing. They've taken bits and pieces, picked what they liked. They're on fire. There's no doubt about it, they're on fire. Boy, they get excited. They're traveling all over the country. They're, they're uh, in the courts all the time battling for their right to do what they do. There's no doubt about it that they're on fire. But they're just on fire in the wrong place, in my opinion. Let's consider one more story on this. Uh, well, let's consider the scene of Bethany as, as described in John 12. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Uh, here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took out a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet and, with her hair. And the house was filled with fragrance of the perfume. One of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? Oh, that sounds like a good intention, doesn't it? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As the keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. it sounded like good intentions on the outside, but here we can see through the scriptures that there were bad intentions behind it. it. Sounded like a pretty good idea up front, though, didn't it? Jesus replied, verse 7, leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd uh, of Jews that uh, found out that Jesus was there and came, not only be, uh, because of, um, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. Here we see all kinds of intentions. The Pharisees are looking after their organization. Judas is looking after him. On the outside, they may say, well, we're trying to preserve our church. This is the way we operate. But on the inside, what they're really worried about is them. Continuing, uh, let's look at Luke 38 real quick. I'm running out of time, so I'll try to cram this in quick. Luke 10, verse 38. Uh, as Jesus and his disciples were, wait a minute. Where am I at? Did I scroll the wrong way or did I copy? My Bible does weird things sometimes. It doesn't always stay in one spot. Yeah, Luke 10. Let's see. I can read Luke 10. I had Luke 10 up there a minute ago, didn't I? I did. I got it twice. I just liked it. It was really good. It meant a lot to me, so I said it twice. But I'll move on since I'm running out of time. One of the funny things about a fire, if you've ever tried to build a fire, run a fireplace, uh, maybe you cook on fire, if you use wood in a smoker, like I've been known to do from time to time, there's a, a funny thing about fire. You can't have just one log. You ever tried to set just one log on fire? Use a lighter or a match? You might get a little fire for a while, but it smolders and burns out. If you have a big log and a little log, the little log burns out, 
and that big log is left all by itself, it may smolder for a little while or burn for a little while, while. That second log will go out. Maybe if you pump a lot of air across it, put a lot of effort into it, it can be done, but it is very difficult to do. You can't have a one log fire. So the heat from the one log heats the other log. That log, as it heats, lets off gases. The gases burn. It creates heat while those gases burn. It heats the other log. It gives off gases. And it's a funny cycle like that. The one helps the other. Without each other, they go out. Uh, there was a story two or three years ago. Somebody put a log in their, their wood burning stove. It was here in Wichita. Put a log in their wood burning stove. Decided it was getting a hot in there. Well, it was early in the morning. Maybe it was uh, one or two in the morning. They pulled one log out. Didn't look like it was burning. So I don't know. They left it by itself. Around nothing combustible. Probably would have been fine. They put it on top of the wood pile. <laughs> Guess what happened to the rest of the wood pile? The whole thing went up in flames. In the house. I think that guy made it out alive. I was going to look that up, but I, uh, I neglected We're the same way in Christ. We need each other. We need to be encouragement uh, to each other. This cow butt seminar that, that I'm putting together, if it was just me paying for it out of my own pocket, I could do it, but it's going to be a lot harder. And I'm not just talking about the money. When I have people come up to me and say, I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, I want to see this succeed. Let me know what I can do to help. That encourages me. That's why... I chose to continue on this path uh, without the financial support of this congregation because so many people were so encouraging about this event that I, I was on fire for it. And there are other people that are on fire, were on fire for it, and it was contagious, and we want to see this thing su succeed. And we can see that in our everyday lives, things that we do. If there, you have a program, and we've got a lot of people working that program, there's a lot of excitement. The excitement builds, the excitement builds, as long as there's something that keeps stirring the fire and keeps the oxygen mixing in there and all that kind of thing, the fire can grow and build. We add more fuel, we make more heat, and, and we're excited to go. But if we let the fire die out, let the smaller logs die out, leave maybe only one or two and they're not close enough together, maybe top sections are all charred and the bottom section can't get any oxygen, left by, left by themselves, the fire still goes out. Fellowship is an extremely important aspect of our lives. Take the cruising that we had uh, just uh, yesterday. Fellowship, hanging out with fellow Christians, not necessarily talking about anything scriptural, just enjoying each other's company in a setting that comfortable. We don't have to worry about putting a guard up or people attacking us for what we believe or, or people saying things around our kids that we may not like. It's, it's an encouragement. It, it builds us up. And we had a lot of people that wanted to do it again because we had such a great time yesterday. Let me try to wrap up really quick. Uh, Ephesians 4, uh, starting in verse 7. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascend mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to the apostles, some to the prophets, some to the evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of fullness in Christ. Jesus came down in fellowship with us. He walked down here with us. He's the highest high, yet he lowered himself and he, he fought the good fight on earth with us. We all have different jobs in this church. We all have different jobs 
trying to build this thing up. But in the end, we all have one goal, and that's unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Hebrews 4, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus came down here as an example, as an encouragement. He walked the streets. He worked with the people. did the same things we do. If you're struggling in your daily walk, if your fire is smoldering, smoldering, or maybe it's gone out, maybe it's never been lit at all, Take heart in knowing that Jesus came down here to be with us. He descended from the heavens and walked with us and struggled with us so that we may receive mercy. He died for us. He put a plan in place to give us hope. We offer an invitation for those that need help in their daily walk. We, we sing the song, hopefully it's an encouragement so that you can come forward and let your needs be known. There's many people here who will gladly help you. But we can't help you if you don't ask. So why don't you come as we stand and sing.